This panel is on governance DeFi and investing today. I'm really excited to talk to Andrew Kang. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Michelle. Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Where are you now? I'm in Taiwan. Awesome. Awesome. I love Taiwan. Taiwan's okay. amazing. One of the safest country. <laughs> yeah, no COVID here. <laughs> That's so awesome. Let's do some introduction. So Andrew, what do you do? Tell us about yourself. Sure. So um, I'm founder of Mechanism Capital. Mm -hmm. We are a crypto fund that um, trades and invests in crypto assets. Mm -hmm. um, really, you know, our primary focus is in, in the DeFi space and a lot of our members, you know, our roots were really within these early DeFi communities with projects like Synthetics and MakerDAO and, and ThorChain. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of successes and we've also seen a lot of failures and, you know, essentially what we are trying to do is leverage a lot of the insights that we've learned from, you know, these earlier DeFi projects and bring them over to some of these new projects that are now forming in the space. What is the state of DeFi right now? The state of DeFi is, I'd say it sounds like we're not quite mainstream yet. I haven't really heard much of DeFi on CNBC, but <laughs> the space is, is, is exploding in terms of, you know, the amount of developer talent that's coming in, mm -hmm. the amount of actual value that's being transmitted across DeFi. Right. Um, when you look at metrics that kind of track the activity of the DeFi space, like uh, transaction volume and value of assets locked in DeFi, you know, they're they're kind of following that hockey stick growth. Mm -hmm. Where you know, just to give you an example, uh, value locked in DeFi was something like less than a billion dollars just earlier this year, and now it's it's around fifteen billion dollars. So it's a fifteen x growth and wow. you know, fifteen billion dollars is nothing to, to laugh about. DeFi stands for decentralized finance. How about the role of governance tokens in blockchain-based projects and the blockchain ecosystem at large? Yeah, governance tokens are pretty integral to the DeFi space. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost the case where pretty much every single DeFi protocol mm -hmm. you could consider their token a governance token mm -hmm. because for these protocols to actually be decentralized in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. They can't be governed by any central entity or, or a central body or a central group of people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how governance works is that these protocols are essentially managed by the, the token holders, which you can kind of think as think mm -hmm. of as shareholders, but, you know, probably more active than actual shareholders in the, in the sense that a lot of these token holders are actually, you know, contributing to the protocol on a day-to-day -day basis or they're voting on issues more than just say once a year or, or, or once a quarter mm -hmm. in terms of you know how the protocol should be developed or managed in, in, in some ways. And, and so, you know, this kind of, I guess, growth of governance tokens has allowed a lot of these DeFi protocols to, how should I say this, be a little more agile in terms of the protocol, or in terms of the financial technology that they build because you know there's no one group of people or one entity that say regulators can 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 target when they're kind of assessing these these protocols right mm -hmm. in traditional corporate governance structure you have an executive team consisting of the ceo cfo cto and the CMO, and then you have the board of directors and you have your shareholder. There's also different committees like the nomination committee, the compensation committee, and the audit committee. And the intention is to avoid conflict of interest and also to keep things independent from each other so that there is transparency and accountability. With regards to blockchain projects with governance tokens, do you feel that they are more efficient the community seems to have a say in making proposal. Who prioritizes these proposal? Is it through majority vote? How does that work? And there's a lot of different ways in which you know, these governance tokens can govern, say, a DeFi protocol. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's really on a spectrum, right? Where you, know, you can have one system where it's like every single issue is voted on by token holders down to mm -hmm. say like, you know, should we be paying this contractor for the work that they did, like yes or no, or mm -hmm. um, should should we be, you know, adding this like modification on like the user user interface? But obviously, 
you know, that's not like a very efficient way to go about things. So, you know, you, you have governance or some of the other, other side of things where say, you know, maybe token holders, they might vote once a year for say, you know, a council that is more doing the day-to-day -day management mm -hmm. of things, or maybe they will only vote on say, major upgrades to the protocol, which mm -hmm. might only happen say once a month. And, and so, you know, different protocols take on a different forms in terms of how they use these tokens to, to manage the protocol. And I would say, you know, there's no perfect formula yet. You know, this kind of uh, area of, of this new kind of method of governance is, is, is so new that, you know, everyone's just kind of experimenting and, and figuring things out, right? But there are kind of trade-offs that all of these different systems play with. Let's talk about governomics, which is governance economics. When you're investing in projects, what are you looking for in terms of their governance economics? For us as a, you know, investors, mm -hmm. we wouldn't specifically be analyzing their, their governance system per se, because this is always something that then could be changed. These things are, are really fluid. So if we feel that things aren't being done efficiently, you know, we, we could always, you know, lend a hand as investors and kind of give some examples of more efficient ways that these systems have been structured. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what's more important for us is looking at, of course, at the, the quality of the team and, you know, secondly, you know, do, do these projects actually have product market fit, which mm -hmm. sounds simple enough, but, you know, there's a lot of projects out there that, that, that don't. And I guess, you know, it's us, up to us as investors to be able to realize that based on our experience in, in finance and our experience in, in crypto. What do you look for, though, as an investor? We have startups, then we have blockchain-based projects, and then we have DeFi. And finance is sophisticated enough that a lot of people don't understand it. Now we're adding blockchain, and now we're adding decentralization. So as an investor, what do you look for, and what do you prioritize? So, so if we're just speaking about DeFi, I mean, I think like really kind of I think we maybe take a step back and think about the key value value proposition of DeFi, which is that it allows engineers and and you know these talented founders to be able to innovate and to mm -hmm. be able to iterate and, and create new financial applications mm -hmm. on a very, very quick basis. Mm -hmm. Whereas say like in the traditional world, it might take you say a year or so to launch a FinTech app because you know you have to get this license and then you know you have to plug into this this banking system and then you know you have to work with you know, so, so, and so regulator, whereas in DeFi, you know, it could be done in a day because all you need to do is maybe, you know, type up this smart contract code and then deploy it onto say Ethereum, you know, on day one, you can start interacting with real money, right? There are, you know, tens of billions of dollars on, on Ethereum ready to kind of interact with these DeFi protocols. And, you know, there are people with, you know, what I would consider very low risk tolerance or very high risk tolerance that are you know excited to kind of play around with these, this new financial machinery. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, this is all kind of to say that we look for projects that are really innovating and, and, and building new financial technology that doesn't exist because that's kind of really the key value proposition of, of DeFi today. Mm -hmm. What is community like in DeFi? For a blockchain-based project, you still need that network effects. For DeFi, is it harder than before? I remember in the good old crypto days, investors expect to see 50,000 members on Telegram, which is funny because that does not equal to conversion. Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, I, I think previously back in 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. you, you were in, investing in these visions and in, in these white papers, but mm -hmm. you know now you're actually investing in stuff that actually has traction and there are real working products which you can use and you're seeing other people use. So, you know, we look at projects that are both, you know, already trading on the secondary markets and are, are live and liquid today. But we also look at, you know, say private primary market deals as well. And, and you know, for the, the secondary market stuff, you know, you can obviously look at usage and, you know, transaction volume and, um, you know, user numbers, addresses uh, interacting with the smart contracts on a daily basis. But, you know, if you're talking primary market, usually, you know, these protocols haven't launched yet. So for us, like, you know, they could have zero, they could not even have a Telegram channel or not even have, you know, say like a Twitter account. That's 
that's not important. You know, if they actually have a product that has product market fit, then they're gonna they're gonna be able to get that very quickly. Mm -hmm. And what is product market fit? So product market fit is you know uh, the concept that there's actually a market for your product. It's kind of sounds simple enough, but <laughs> I'll just give you one example, right? Like sure. if you look at compound finance, mm -hmm. they're a money market where which allows people to borrow and lend crypto assets. Mm -hmm. So I can put my Bitcoin in there and I can receive an interest rate on it, mm -hmm. or I can put my Bitcoin on there and then I can borrow, say, USDC, a stable coin, and and pay an interest rate to borrow that. And you know, I might do that because I'm looking to lever up on a trade or looking to do some basis or, or funding trade or, or whatever. Um, whereas you know, that type of money market doesn't really exist in CFI today or exists in kind of very limited capacity or mm -hmm. exists with very little liquidity. Mm -hmm. But you know, this this compound finance, right? They've you know already have a billion plus dollars of liquidity on on their platform. And so, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's live, so it has a billion dollars liquidity, so we can say there's product market fit here. But thinking back as, you know, as an investor, if this application was, wasn't live, you know, if someone were to come to us and say, hey, look, we're launching a money market, something like this doesn't exist right now. And the fact that we make it decentralized and we build it on, on Ethereum means that we'd be able to offer a lot more assets and we would be able to reduce operational costs and we wouldn't have to run, like manage a whole team mm -hmm. and pay for say like cloud infrastructure because it's hosted on Ethereum. I would think, yeah, like that's a pretty, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good model. I, you know, there's obviously a need for that because people are using more on lending services right now in, in centralized finance, right? Mm -hmm. Genesis is a huge business. They do billions of dollars in borrow lend activity. You know, there's going to be a market for this in, in DeFi as well. Awesome. What is your vision for DeFi? My vision for DeFi is it really kind of, I would say, 100xing the pace of financial innovation, mm -hmm. making financial innovation more more efficient and also more accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it, if you just look at, you know, maybe like the two or three years that DeFi has been alive for, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff that's come out of it that doesn't exist in, you know, our current world. What are you excited about? Maybe like the most apparent one would be just Uniswap. The decentralized exchange is trading at like, I think a $4 billion valuation right now. Mm -hmm. And they do something like between 300 million and $500 million of trading volume every single day. Mm -hmm. And really the innovation there is that, that they've implemented what's called an automated market maker. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, the traditional exchange that you think about, say like, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange or say, you know, Binance or Coinbase, where you have people sending these limit orders and executing these market orders, and you know you have market makers providing liquidity to the system. Mm -hmm. Instead, you know you have the system where you have quote unquote liquidity providers that provide liquidity in an automated way based on kind of this, this preset formula, right? You know they're able to do so profitably in in mm -hmm. most cases, and you know this kind of innovation has really led to an explosion of kind of exchange exchange volumes and activity in DeFi because it removes a lot of the friction in potentially bootstrapping new markets. Because before, think about the process of like bootstrapping a new market. If you want your token listed on an exchange, you'd have to find a market maker. You'd have to pay them, say, you know, ten to $20,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have to coordinate with an exchange on that. And then you have to get a listing fee. Uniswap, you, you remove all of that, right? You can mm -hmm. list a new token in a day and have... Mm -hmm training people buying and selling it in, in the same day. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the role of governance tokens in DeFi in the future? I think governance systems are going to get a lot more efficient. They're going to be obviously evolved more to take it to kind of learn from, I guess, some of the inefficiencies that we've learned in previous iterations. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at some of the early governance systems like MakerDAO, for example, where protocol changes were completely derived via on-chain voting, mm -hmm. a lot of the newer systems have completely moved away from that because what's ended up happening was, you know, people saw that there was very low voter participation. There were a few lone, you know, whales just kind of controlling the vote. Yeah. <laughs> there were issues with snap, snap voting and, and borrowing lending tokens just to vote. 
Do you think voting will become free? Today, you need tokens in order to vote. Do you think that the DeFi ecosystem will move away from money in terms of voting? In terms of money, I mean, you know, you could theoretically split out a tokens into a two token system or say you have a government token and then you have like a cash flow token. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, I think there are one or two projects out there that, that do that, but, mm-hmm. you know, generally I think, you know, the simpler the better. And, you know, these token systems where the token counts for both, you know, voting power and then also cash flows and whatever else utility that these tokens have has been working out pretty well. Yes, I love how agile the governance models could be. They could be different for each project. They're customizable, which is really, really cool. So it's really dependent on the intention, the mission, the vision, the purpose, and the priority of each company and each organization. Um, you know, a system where, you know, all, all shares have an equal amount of votes. And, you know, most people are going to want, if they want the cash flow, they probably also want the ability to influence the system. If they want the ability to influence the system, probably also want to benefit from the cash flow. Would you be afraid of a hostile takeover? Would that occur in a DeFi project where another project would want it to take over by buying out all the governance tokens? I mean, we, we've actually seen that happen to an extent where there have been certain crypto financial institutions or, mm-hmm. or funds even that have bought tokens for the sole sake of influencing governance votes mm-hmm. uh, because these protocols control quite a bit of money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes they will have certain rewards programs that are able to direct money mm-hmm. to certain, you know, actors in the system or stakeholders in the system. So you know, where there's a way to kind of financially benefit there, people are going to be able to try to take advantage of that. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's already been happening. And I think that'll happen a lot more in the future. We have one minute left. What is your one wisdom that you would like to share with a community? Or what is your last words with regards to DeFi investing and governance? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say like the best way for the system to evolve is to have more people that are thinking about this a lot, you know, actually come in and engage with the communities and maybe share some helpful best practices because a lot of, you know, these DeFi projects that are coming up, you know, a lot of these are engineers or they're product managers and, you know, they don't really have experience designing these systems in terms of like how rules are created and, and, and you know how rules are put in, into effect, and I think I think this is like really a, a exciting opportunity to essentially shape a model that you know a lot of these DeFi protocols can leverage in the future. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome! Thank you, Andrew. This has been so much fun. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Michelle. Okay, bye bye. Thank you.